Hello everyone, my name is Colby, and here we also have Joaquin and... Joaquin, now my name right. Sorry. It's fine. And, uh, your name? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 I'm Vic. Yeah, and, uh, you know, today we're going to be responding to the School of Life, a uh, video they did on democracy, and, you know, kind of, uh, basically they're criticizing democracy uh, by what Socrates said, especially in ancient Athens, because, you know, ancient Athens was, wasn't a republic, they were a direct democracy. Uh, anyway, you know, they're a really smug, liberal, sexist group, and uh, basically their argument is, oh, democracy is mob rule, we need to have restrictions on it here and there, and, uh, yeah. yeah so, uh, but uh, you know, we're here to respond to this video from a Marxist perspective because we're Marxist Leninists. We believe in democracy. We believe in a revolutionary democracy, a direct revolutionary democracy that that the workers control. And uh, you know, this was something that they had in the Soviet Union, but it wasn't just like the democracy we have in America, a bourgeois democracy. It was a workers' democracy or a council democracy, you know, because Soviet is actually Russian for council. Highlighting right here, it says council democracy, because you know, like the workers exercise power and control the means of production of the state through councils. And then there's a pretty good on it. Uh, I'm trying to find it in here. Uh, we'll have this. Here's a book about democracy in the USSR, as I should say, workers' democracy. So anyway, now that that's out of the way, let's actually start talking about the video. Are we ready to respond to it, gentlemen? Yeah, start shooting all over this video. Let's go. Okay. Oh, let's start some with the Moracha. We're used to thinking very highly of democracy, and by extension, of ancient Athens, the civilization that gave rise to it. Yeah, because, you know, France before the French Revolution was a really great place. I mean, it was definitely, you know, why do we think we have any of democracy? Because without it, it's, you know, people have no say in society. Just look at France before the revolution, pre-revolution, you know, the ancien regime. Yeah, it was basically like a, well, it wasn't just basically, it was a monarchy. An absolute, they weren't just any monarchy, they were an absolute monarchy. You know, well, actually, that, yeah, that's kind of misleading because the king was really weak. The nobles took advantage of him. I, I think them saying that kind of, it kind of uh, exposes their elitist viewpoint. Like, they, they don't really relate to the common people. Yeah. And of course, like, yeah, why would you want to say? Yeah, they just, like, drink champagne to, like, of fucking pledge. General doesn't count in an outlet, so they had a revolution. And they try to spread that revolution, and they were all crushed and by 1815. The Parthenon has become almost a byword for democratic values, which is why so many leaders of democracies like to be photographed there. It's therefore very striking to discover that one of ancient Greece's greatest achievements, philosophy, was highly suspicious of its other achievement, democracy. The founding father. What do you think? Because a lot of the times the philosophers are these rich guys, and of course the rich people are going to be pretty happy about being accountable to the masses. Or, you know, a lot of philosophers are like, you know, counter what the uh, current state does. Like, Marx lived under capitalism. Well, yeah, not all, I mean, I'm not saying all philosophers are snobby bitches, but, I mean, no, I'm saying like in society with slaves, you know, it's, you know, it's only the wealthy who have time to think about. Society and you know those people might have bias. Not always, you know. But then again, you could you could even say Marx and Engels. You know, they actually came. You know, Engels came from a really rich family. Therefore, he actually had the time to ponder things. But he went down a different road. He went to you know he became alongside Marx, the founder of Marxism. Yeah. 
and especially especially in uh, how hierarchical the uh, Greek society was. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the rich dudes only. They were the only ones that had time to think. Yeah, I mean, then again, that's going to happen in a lot of societies. I mean, you know, if you're working or busy, you're not going to have that much time to think to be a philosopher. You know, and it's the rich people who get the time to think, and most of them are yeah. biased for the system. Like, if you're a worker, you're, like, too busy working for, like, 14 hours a day, like, doing hard labor. You don't have time to be, like, a philosopher. You're just, like, a worker, I guess. Father of Greek philosophy, Socrates, is portrayed in the dialogues of Plato as hugely pessimistic about the whole business of democracy. In Book 6 of The Republic, Plato describes Socrates falling into conversation with a character called Adimantus and trying to get him to see the flaws of democracy by comparing a society to a ship. If you were heading... Yeah, we can compare all of yeah, but it's, but a society. A society is a very complex thing. A ship's a boat with a sail. And that's right. pretty much it. Like, okay, a ship's run by a captain. We need to know the difference between a boat and a ship. You know, like a boat can fit on a ship, a ship can't fit on a boat. Anyway, go, sorry, go ahead. We're running off topic here, but you, you know what I was saying. Well, yeah, I don't think. Society and a ship are much different. Out on a journey by sea, asks Socrates. And I should add that, you know, a ship is just usually has one destination and they're just trying to get there, you know, that's the end of it. Well, society is many more variables and many more different goals and ideas. Well, everyone, just about everyone on the ship has a destination and they want to get there. And, uh, you know, there's not hardly as many variables and disagreements in society, you know. A voyage is really just a usually, unless there's a mutiny, which doesn't happen that often, you know, it's really just a unified objective to get somewhere, and there's not going to be much disagreement. Who would you ideally want deciding who was in charge of the vessel? Just anyone, or people educated in the rules and demands of seafaring? The latter, of course, says Adimantus. So why then, responds Socrates, do we keep thinking that any old... And again, you know, a ship is a lot different than society. Because, yeah, there are no, there are no contradictions no, during, no. during a voyage. It's all one common goal. Well, there might but, be a mutiny every now and then. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and, you know, and again, I would also say, you know, they'd say, oh, you know, in a war, you can't have all the soldiers vote on something. Like, you can't have something like a voyage or war. But, you know, it's different because things like this, these are issues that require quick decision making by a few people. There's no time for democracy, but in society as a whole, we do have time for democracy and democratic decision making. You know, in a war, in the heat of battles, you need a general to make a decision like that. You know, there can't they can't hold a vote among all the soldiers in the heat of battle. You know, but in society, we can do that, and that's different. You know, maybe not on a voyage. You know, when something bad happens, the captain can swap. But you know, these are fundamentally different things. Yeah, and they, they have this, like, elitist viewpoint where they, they think that uh, only bureaucrats can run society, but they, they fail to realize that the masses are society. Hmm, so like so why, why, would, why would they not be qualified? Sounds like left economics than the ex-Marxist. Hmm. Shade, the shade has been thrown. Yeah, he just wants to have a bunch of EU bureaucrats run things. Because he's super smart. He has charts right. and shit, man. Right, let's person should be fit to judge who should be the ruler of a country. Socrates' point is that voting in an election is a skill, not a random intuition. And like any skill, it needs to be taught systematically to people. Letting the citizenry vote without an education is as irresponsible as putting them in charge of a trireme sailing to Samos in a storm. Socrates was to have first-hand, catastrophic experience of the foolishness of voters. In 399 BC, the philosopher was put on trial on trumped-up charges of corrupting the youth of Athens. A jury of 500... So, I'm going to... That probably should have responded to this. Right here we think about uh, we can't just let the uneducated vote. You know, and this is something that needs to be mentioned. Is, you know, what stratum of society can be uneducated? You know, the poor, the working class. Yeah. Proletariat and why? Well, because they have less opportunities. You know, either they can't afford it, or you know, there are public schools, but 
you know, they're trapped in these bad neighborhoods where they can't make enough money, you know, send those kids to these bad schools, and, you know, it's a generational thing, you know, poor people, you know, are they're in the poverty trap, and it just starts with bad education, and therefore, if yeah. they have a bad education in their society, they can't vote, you know, you're essentially trapping the poor people into the trap of not voting by saying the uneducated can't vote. Who's uneducated? The poor. poor but it's like, and this guy's ideal society, I'll maybe like the bourgeois one, the petty bourgeois, petty bourgeois. How do you pronounce it? Petty, petty. Petty, petty bourgeois would end up voting. Which, uh, but, yeah. Anyway, the whole point is by saying only the educated can vote, you know, you're discriminating the poor unless you have. Yeah, it's you know, unless we can provide good education for the poor and make them not poor, then the system you're proposing essentially excludes poor people from voting. Maybe consider we could have good education for everyone so there won't be any uneducated everyone can vote. But yeah, basically what they're proposing here is a way to keep the poor from voting because the poor are going to be uneducated because they're poor because of material conditions. So anyway, that's, yeah. In 399 BC, the philosopher was put on trial on trumped-up charges of corrupting the youth of Athens. A jury of 500 Athenians was invited to weigh up the case and decided by a narrow margin that the philosopher was guilty. He was put to death by hemlock in a process which is, for thinking people, every bit as tragic as Jesus' condemnation has been for Christians. Crucially, Socrates... And how are we supposed to know he isn't guilty? I mean, I don't know. I haven't looked at his crimes, but I mean... We're having, they're giving us an assumption of innocence here. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know anything. But I don't know much about Socrates. Maybe he was guilty. Maybe he wasn't. I don't know. I think that's relevant, though. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I got a problem. He was not elitist in the normal sense. He didn't believe that... Oh, really? Wait, what? The, literally a... everything he said... He's ever said fear, uh, favors bureaucrats over the masses. It's just like when people say, I'm not racist, but I mean, is he something super racist? Well, actually, I'm not a white supremacist, I'm a white nationalist. Oh, Get yeah. it right. Hey, man, I, I'm, a, I'm not a Nazi, I'm a fascist. There's a big difference there. Oh, I'm not a racist, I'm a race realist. Uh -huh. There. Okay. I'm a race realist and cap 1488. Viva Europa. <laughs> Europa spelled with a V. A narrow few should only ever vote. He did, however, insist that only those who had thought about issues rationally and deeply should be let near a vote. And exactly, I mean, this is, goes into what I said earlier. It's when you decide who's smart, you know. You know, because, you know, you're including, you know, when poor people can't get good education because of material conditions, you're, you know, you, again, you're trapping the poor in a cycle of not voting, and when poor people can't even vote in the first place, they don't have a way of voicing, saying to politicians, hey, we're poor, do something about it, you know? It's something I also should add. It's not only, you know, when poor people can't vote, they're going to be poor because politicians aren't going to care until they're held accountable to poor voters. Yeah, also, how do we decide who doesn't get to vote, who gets to vote? Well, like, in this guy's yeah, ideal society. And, uh, like, yeah, they, they say that, uh, only those who have pondered history. Well, well, if you look at, like, the working class, uh, everything they, they have ever, uh, considered about their situation is pondering history because history is a class struggle to us so to assess their conditions as poor working class people is to is to assess history and again you know think about it we have these poor working people and they want to voice their uh, ideas in the political system to make themselves not the elect politicians who will get them out of poverty but you know what do you think you know but what do you know they can't vote because they didn't talk because they don't they're too busy to ponder things rationally because they're poor, you know, you're trapping them in poverty by excluding them from the political system. We have forgotten this distinction between an intellectual democracy and a democracy by birthright. Oh we have. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus. I'm very smart. Like, they're. <laughs> that's basically what they're doing here. So just, you know, saying, oh, we're, we're, we're so smart here, we can vote. Given the vote to all without connecting it to wisdom. 
and Socrates knew exactly where that would lead Only to a system the Greeks feared vote. above all, all right. demagoguery. Yes, totally Ancient Athens had painful experience of demagogues. For example, the louche figure of Alcibiades, a rich, charismatic, smooth-talking, wealthy man who eroded basic freedoms and helped to push Athens to its disastrous military adventures in Sicily. Socrates knew how easily people seeking election could exploit our desire for... E oh my God. Okay, but what the fuck do you think happens when no one there? There's no democracy. Like shit, like that happens. Okay, so like here, what they're trying to say is they're trying to, uh, you know, the whole make Athens great again. You know, they can tell like they're trying to put the other way. Yeah, right after Trump got elected. You know, so they're trying to say, oh, you know, they're trying to uphold Trump as a model of democracy, you know, like demagoguery. He wasn't even democratically elected. You know, he was elected by yeah. the electoral college. He came in second place in the election. Uh, you know, he was not democratically elected, so he, he was elected by an elite in you know, the electoral college, which is an idea put forward by the founding fathers right. who are using the yeah. same anti-democratic arguments you guys are. You know, because Thomas and Jefferson and George Washington and all those guys, they also, you know, they didn't like mob rule. They wanted moderate democracy and they wanted a republic. And that's, you know, what made the American Revolution different from the French Revolution. The American Revolution, it was good. It was revolutionary pretty toned down and moderate, you know, if anything, they just wanted independence from Britain. Very progressive and democratic, and they wanted a democracy for everyone. You know, the French... And they have the... Oh, yeah, you can go. Oh, I, I was uh, going to say that their implication is that... Uh, like the common people, they'll they'll elect people that won't work in their interests. No, like I with think it, really yeah, with their, yeah, they're, they're comparing uh, whoever to uh, Trump. So they're just saying that that democracy, like letting any just anybody vote, uh, will lead to uh, basically the death of democracy. But it's it's their it's <coughs> their elitist viewpoint that di makes people disenfranchised in the in the first place. Here. And elect people like Trump. Yeah, exactly. Here, uh, results. Yeah, uh, you know, so Donald Trump, he's elected by this electoral college here. You know, again, I mean, this idea by these slaveholding county fathers with an elitist agenda. You know, they wanted to preserve their power as slaveholding capitalists and as, you know, these rich white dudes. You know, they didn't want to be too big on popular democracy. And again, here, uh, where's the federal? You know, so exactly here, Hillary, you know, Donald Trump, here it is in second place, Hillary, I mean, I don't like Hillary, but to be fair, she did win, and Donald Trump did not win the popular vote, you know, and here they are upholding him as a failure of democracy when he not, was not democratically elected, anyway, just, let's keep going. Easy answers. More like he asked us to imagine an election debate between two candidates, one who was like a doctor and the other who was like a sweet shop owner. The sweet shop owner would say of his rival, look, this person here has worked many evils on you. He hurts you, gives you bitter potions and tells you not to eat and drink whatever you like. He'll never serve you feasts of many and varied pleasant things like I will. Socrates asks us to consider the audience's response. Do you think the doctor would be able to reply effectively? The true answer, I cause you trouble and go against your desires in order to help you. Oh yeah, cutting someone's head open to let out the evil spirits and really helping people. Sorry, I just pointed it out. No, but like, but anyway, the would cause an uproar you. among the voters, don't you think? We have forgotten. No, I don't think that. You know, I do believe people are rational. And like, for example, there is this one town in America Cave Creek, and you know, like uh, there was this uh, company that owned a strip of land, you know, and it was, you know, belonged to the Native Americans. They had lots of their, they don't live there anymore, but they had all their artwork and stuff on rocks, and it was just this beautiful place. You know, they wanted to build a golf course there, and the people, the Cave Creekers, were very angry about this, you know. They wanted to preserve the place, so they voted to raise the taxes on themselves so the town government could buy the place and, uh, you know, give it, make it a park, uh, make it protected nature. So that's what, and then that's what happened. You know, they voted raise taxes on themselves and the town government bought it. And now I'm trying to remember what it's called. It's called Spurfrost Recreation Area. 
but yeah, that's what happened. You know, they voted to raise taxes on themselves because they, you know, so just yeah, they know that the doctor is helping them, is doing the mean things to help them, just like they voted taxes to raise taxes on themselves because they want to preserve that place for themselves. You know, and I've been to it; it's a beautiful place. You know, it's like, well, good decision. Does this guy think that like regular people are like Neanderthals? Yeah, he probably like, does. They just do every anything in their personal interest, just or like uh, not personal interest, uh, uh, immediate satisfaction. That's like is, is he that much of an elitist that he's literally <laughs> capitalism? There's uh, but yeah, well, people, short-term gain or long-term fuck-ups. You know, I mean, again, he says, oh, you know, these. I mean, people are really suspicious when politicians go around promising nice things. It's just like the sweet shop owner goes around promising nice things. I mean, wouldn't you agree that voters are suspicious about all politicians giving wonderful promises while they really like realistic politicians? You know? Yeah, like, uh, Trump had some, like, populist rhetoric, which is why I see a lot of people voted for him. Yeah, and I find but... it ironic that, like, I thought, like, the day, like, it was the day of the election, and I was the morning, and I thought there's no way Trump could win without the popular and his populist narrative would be destroyed forever and he would be depicted as such a hypocrite. I thought he couldn't get away with it, and he did. I'm surprised he gets away with his populist rhetoric and doesn't win the popular vote. I thought, thought on yeah, that day before the election, I mean, on the election day, if Hillary wins without the popular vote, they're going to be the mainstream media and the corporate elite and the yeah, 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 you know, they would be so pissed off about it. That'd be right. Un un somewhat understandably, you know, but then when they... Yeah. What you wait? Hold on. Get sidetracked for a second. Who do you think was going to win the election? I thought it was going to be Hillary. We all did. I thought Trump was going to win the election. Well, I guess you look like a genius now. Yeah. I mainly said that to piss off my parents, who are liberals. But. But yeah, I do believe voters know what they're getting into. You know, they don't like politicians who go around promising unrealistic things. You know, people are suspicious of that. You know, they like realistic politics. All about Socrates' salient warnings against democracy. We have preferred to think of democracy as an unambiguous good rather than as something that is only ever as effective as the education system that surrounds it. As a result, we have elected many sweet shop owners and very few doctors. Okay, so fix your damn education system. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think that's... He's, he, he, he's thinking like the... Uh... The education system has no ability to reform, and therefore, just like democracy will never work, because capitalism is the only way. Oh yeah. So, uh, Imagine if there was an economic system that got rid of capitalism completely. Oh, did you know? Okay, so like after uh, you know, uh, after the Napoleonic Wars, after the French Empire and Napoleon was defeated, the Bourbon monarchy, you know, was restored, and King Louis the you know, this was in 1815, the Congress of Vienna, all the reactionary and counter-revolutionary monarchies of old Europe, they decided, when we defeat Napoleonic France, we're going to make sure these revolutions never happen, ever, ever, ever again. And they decided that they wanted to restore the Bourbon monarchy in France just to, you know, rub it in everyone's face about how their revolution was for nothing. And, you know, that's what happened. Napoleon was defeated, and Louis the 18th was crowned king of France in 1815. And, uh, you know, the Wikipedia article about it, urban restoration. And, you know, basically, you know, but not all the revolutionary gains were in vain, because even though you know, the monarchies were all the monarchs were now held accountable to the Constitution and the parliaments of much of Europe, you know, however, you know, that does not mean that it was a great power, because in this new monarchy, like, they had a Senate and like, a parliament, what was it called? Yeah, they had a parliament, but like only 1% of the population was eligible to vote. Like this, here, it's right here. Uh, the franchise limited to men with considerable property holdings, and just 1% of people could vote. This is probably what they, Ooh, this is like their democracy. Right here. <laughs> uh, and like, okay, I can't. Only, vote. only white men with property could since vote. I can't, what? Since I can't really cite Wikipedia, I'm going to show their citations right here. Page. Oh, oh nice guy. Page, uh, here, this book right here, and it's page, oh god, I got so lost, 
Get the gallery. Uh, oh yeah, right here. I think? I don't know. Just command F it. Yeah, I'm just gonna control F. That's um, what I just said. Okay. okay, yeah, here we go. So yeah, and it's page... Well, you can understand through that, but, but anyway, yeah, this is like their ideal society here. Only 1% of the population is low, rich, white dudes with a ton of land. There's democracy. There's our there's our rational democracy right there. Oh, can I read the thing I sent you in the group chat? Uh, what group chat? The one Oof. that the Dawkins and Liberal thing. Oh, God. Well, can we finish the video first? All right. Yeah, I'll finish it first. But yeah, you know, because after the French Revolution, you know, the monarchists, their whole argument against the French, the French Revolution was, oh, it was tyrannical mob rule, and the peasants just don't know what's good for them. That's why they need a strong king. Now then again, here's Louis the 18th being crowned king of France once more. Uh, you know, you know the people hated him. When they, they you know, the dynasty they worked so hard to overthrow was set up to thrust back on them by foreign invaders. But you know, there wasn't, and, you know, they had a revolution again in 1830, and then another one in 1848. Yeah, the French just have so many revolutions, and then another one in 1871. I mean, the French are like. The leaders just of the Hamilton revolution. kings of revolution. That sounds way too ironic. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're just like the most revolutionary, the most revolutionary, the revolutionaries. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, this one percent of the people could vote. Like this is the top right corner of the political compass right here. Top oh, right. Right. Maybe Pinochet. No. This is Pinochet before Pinochet. No. Forget, ah. Pinochet. forget Pinochet. This is the top right corner of the political. Pinochet was pretty. The bourbon restoration. But yeah, it lasted, well, 1814 to 1830, and there's, 15, a brief there's a brief interruption in 1815. But yeah, that's there. 1% of the population gets to vote. And, uh, you know, then of course there's a revolution against it. But anyway, uh, I think we covered this up pretty good. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. Oh, wait, am I the only one who thinks there should be a basic test for every registered voter for before voting? Yeah, they already had that. Yeah, they got rid of those literacy tests for a reason. Oh, wait, on the application. So, yeah, I think we covered it up here. Uh, have a, uh, bye, everyone. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed the video.